Hello, this is Larry Wilson, and I'd like to welcome you to the ninth tape in this series on the Old Testament prophecies, The Shadows of God. This is series number 209, and this is actually our third tape in the book of Isaiah. I'm not sure how many Isaiah is going to require. It's a rather long book, but I'm so happy to have uh, David Brooks in the studio with me. Welcome back, David. Well, it's good to be back. Why? Missed you uh, in the last tape. Uh, sometimes the window for taping is quite narrow, and <laughs> so I try to jump in and take advantage of the time period when I when I can. And uh, I realize that it may not always conform to your schedule. Yeah, sometimes there are things that happen in your life, and you just have to deal with them. That's you know, right. It's just the way it is. That's <laughs> very true. Very true. Well, we have been uh, studying and examining the book of Isaiah, and before we get into chapter 10 today, uh, I want to make two points about the book of Isaiah that every student of Old Testament prophets needs to deal with. First of all, God has to be very careful about how he reveals prophecy, the future. If God is not careful, people will take God's words and misconstrue them into fatalism, meaning whatever will be will be and there's just no way to change it or we have no, nothing to do about it. Just fatal, fatalistic, um, whatever will be, will be. Or the other side of the ditch, or the other side of the road, the ditch on the other side, is that no matter what we do, God has a plan, and uh, he's going to do what he's going to do. So we can do whatever we choose. That's right. Yeah. Um, In other words, both, both rationales get you to the place where you can do whatever you want to do. Because tomorrow has already been predetermined. And you have no control over That's that. That's correct. Th this, th this is a, a problem uh, that many Christians have. There is a lack of understanding about the ways of God. So God is very careful about how he reveals and how he places the fulfillment of prophecy uh, and what he intends to do within the context of human behavior. Uh, there's a cause and effect uh, relationship that is ongoing. Well, somewhere people have to be able to make a choice that will determine what their future will be. Yes. And if God doesn't give you that, then uh, Satan was right. Yes, that's uh, right. That's so, correct. So either one of those ditches is definitely going to get you in trouble. The human heart is very dull does not catch on quickly, does not understand well, and does not maintain what it once learned very easily. <laughs> and attention, pan, attention spans are pretty short. That's right. That's right. Um, so as we look at the Old Testament prophets, and we are examining uh, the revelation of what God intends to do, what he plans to do, what he's going to do, it all has to be put within the context of a relationship that God insists upon between himself and his created. In other words, whether you like it or not, God does have a relationship with you. Whether you accept it or not, God has accountability uh, placed upon you. As well as responsibility. As well as responsibility. Whether you accept it, believe it, or reject it, deny it, or, or whatever you do with it is immaterial. The fact is that everything that God creates, God is responsible to and he is responsible for. And the Old Testament prophets clearly confirm that, uh, for example, when we talk about the heathen nations, the Assyrians, and we talk about the Egyptians and the Moabites, and etc., 
they deny the, the, the presence of God. They deny the, the sovereignty of the Most High. It's immaterial. God has a relationship with them, regardless of whether they have one with Him. And um, so God's actions and behavior cannot uh, be correctly understood and put within the framework of what His character and His ways are like unless we survey the big picture. And uh, going through Isaiah, chapter by chapter, and uh, Jeremiah and Ezekiel will force the big picture. And I hope that our listeners will be patient and will be persevering to uh, pick up, uh, as we go through these things, how this really comes together. The second thing that I want to say about um, the book of Isaiah and these other prophetic books is that if we were to just study secular history, we would not be able to understand why things happened the way they did. For example, we've talked about this before. You can look at the fall of the Babylonian Empire as simply the fact that the Medes and the Persians became stronger. Secular historians would chronicle the fall of Babylon on the prowess of Cyrus and Darius. And probably on some economical uh, equation that goes back into the devaluation of some currency. <laughs> this, that, and the other. Well, they would search for all kinds of, of answers, but only from the limited view of the human eye. Mm -hmm. The Bible, on the other hand, gives us the third eye, the all-seeing eye, which, from God's perspective, uh, when you read Daniel, for example, chapter 5, when Daniel is called before Belshazzar, you know, uh, Belshazzar, and, and he reads the handwriting on the wall, and Daniel turns to the king and he says, King, you have known since you were a child how God humbled your grandfather Nebuchadnezzar. But you, O king, have not paid attention to the authority of the sovereign God, the one who rules over the kingdoms of men. And he has weighed you and found you short of a balanced measure. Therefore, tonight, this very night, the God of heaven is taking the kingdom from your hand and giving it to another. With that third eye, the prophetic eye, the all-seeing eye, we, God allows us to understand why Babylon fell that night. He is the one who brought about the fall of the, of the Babylonian Empire. He's the one who brought about the fall of the Medo-Persian Empire and the Grecian Empire and the Roman Empire and ultimately the bombing of Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with economics. No. Basically, what it has to do with the condition of the uh, currency of love yeah. or the currency of hate. That's correct. Um, Milosevic, you know, bringing this down to our current time, the conquest in Kosovo and the, the bombing of Yugoslavia, you know, for 70 some odd days, um, all of this, if we could pull the curtain back and see God's involvement in all of life, our amazement, our astonishment at how interested and how involved God really is would be overwhelming. And he allows these things or sets them up to happen in order to control a certain amount of evil. That's correct. On some level. That's correct. To keep it from getting out of hand. Right. Um, I think the um, the earthquake in Turkey. Yes. That uh, everyone is reeling from this week. Uh, I don't know what that means on a theological basis, but when you see perhaps 45,000 people are dead, 
practically that entire country has been hit by this thing. And when you have homes, uh, condominiums, where people's, uh, their particular unit in that condominium was worth, uh, you know, $150,000, and they just had a two-bedroom section of it, and this thing is eight story tall, and the whole thing pancakes down and traps whoever is in it, and they're already bringing all the research, the search people home, and they're just leaving the, uh, the bulldozers and the, uh, the big track hose and all that stuff to dig it out. Uh, disease, I understand now that one of the rescue workers has come down with typhoid and has been uh, quarantined. So it's not over yet. You, you kind of wonder what is behind that curtain that God has been looking at that uh, is the bank account of evil. What, at what point in time did, did something cross the line and it just got away and God had to deal with it? I can't answer that. Right. No, none of us can at, on, we, on this side. We just can't do it. We don't have the, the insight right. uh, to do that. Whether the earthquake was divinely mandated or whether the earthquake was um, the result of just tectonic forces adjusting. Well, geologists will say that they've sucked so much oil out of the ground that the plates start moving, you know. Yes, <laughs> yes. There's all kinds of explanations for it. Um, we, you know, at, at this point in time, we really, can't, we really can't say what was the reason behind it. Uh, the story of Job, you know, is not to be confused with the... Um, affliction, let's say, of the king. Who was it um, whose hand withered while he was at the altar? Uh, was it Rehoboam, if I remember right? Um, God inflicted a suffering upon him uh, immediately because of his rebellion. Well, Miriam. Miriam was Miriam leprous. Miriam had the same thing. That's correct. Miriam was, became leprous. Um, whether you can't honestly, you know, say from Scripture that every leper is under the condemnation of God. Absolutely. That is correct. So, so you really can't say that every earthquake or every hurricane or every tornado. That's correct. Right. That's correct. Uh, all that we can say, uh, taking the Scripture as our basis, is that no matter what happens... God is present. He is involved. He yeah. is concerned. And he's interested in how people react to these things. He, he is interested that people turn to him and be saved. You know, the loss of life is not the same thing to God as it is to us. God need only to speak the word and, hey, 45,000 people are alive. Come so, right back. So it, it's not a problem mm -hmm. for him. Uh, it's the finality of it for us that, that sort of gives us the um, pause, to, you know, for consideration. Well, with that little bit of introduction, that God has to be careful about how he presents prophecy so that we don't end up with fatalism. Or uh, predestination. Or, or predestination. Yeah. <clears throat> and secondly, that without the Bible we can't see around the curve. We need the insight that only the Bible can offer how God is dealing with the issues of life. Those, uh, someone listening to this tape today may be in very serious financial trouble, very serious health trouble, very serious problems in a family or in a work relationship or whatever. And they're trying to sort out, well, where is God in all of this? Where is God? And the, the one thing that the Bible, especially the Old Testament, um, reiterates over and over and over and over again is that God is always present. Nothing escapes him. Even the very number 
of the hairs on our head uh, are numbered. He knows everything about us. So with that, um, we want to go to chapter 10. I think that uh, two things about chapter 10, that, um, of course, chapter 10 follows chapter 9, and I need to make this point about chapter 10 as we get going. God is promising that after he has punished Israel and Judah, over here in chapter 9, and he's going to use the rod of his anger. See down in verse 5. Woe to the Assyrian, the rod of my anger, in whose hand is the club of my wrath. It's kind of interesting. The Assyrian is a heathen, let's say, in the sense that he does not know the God of Israel. He's a pagan, uh, outsider, um, and doesn't care. Doesn't care. And uh, yet God is going to use the king of Assyria as the club of his wrath. To, to, get, to get Israel's attention. To, well, to, <laughs> to punish Israel, that's right. And um, verse 6, I will send him against a godless nation. Isn't that interesting? He calls his own, his own people godless. Yes, I will dispatch him against a people who anger me to seize loot and to snatch plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. But this is not what he intends. This is not what he has in mind. His purpose is to destroy, to put an end to many nations. So the king of Assyria does not have in mind meeting God's pleasure and doing God's will. He has something else entirely in mind, but the Lord is going to use the king and with his own personal ambitions to do what needs to be done to his own people. And you know, I, I saw an interesting parallel. You could almost hear Satan saying these same words here. Uh, are not my commanders all kings? Have all these other kings been destroyed and my hands have seized these kingdoms? Have I not dealt with Jerusalem? And he goes on down through there. Not, not only do you hear uh, the king of Assyria saying that, but you can almost hear Satan saying exactly the same words. Well, in fact, it is Satan moving the king of Assyria. It is Satan... Uh, preying on the man's arrogance and greed. It is Satan uh, who is uh, motivating. And God is going to remove the hedge that he's had around his people so that this club of wrath, if you will, can be fully exercised against a godless nation. See, uh, hold your finger there and go back to chapter... Um, what is it? Five. Yes. Verse five. God says, Now I will tell you what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. Well, if there's any question, verse 7 says, The vineyard the Lord is speaking of here is the house of Israel. So, the Lord's going to tear down the wall, tear down the defenses, tear down the hedge, and he's going to invite the king of Assyria to come over and do whatever he feels like doing. So, so basically, we have a, a punishment scenario going here. Israel has, uh, has angered God to the extent that now it is time for them to handle some punishment. Repeated apostasy, repeated uh, rejection of the invitation to repent produced no discernible change. And finally, this is an important lesson that, that every Christian has to learn. Kindness has its limits. 
This sounds entirely different than what the Christian teaching today is. I, I offer as proof that kindness and mercy, forgiveness, the extension of forgiveness, have, have their limits. I offer as proof of this, A, the expulsion of Lucifer from heaven. There came a time when God said, I can't take this anymore, not having it. I offer as proof the flood in Noah's day. God said, I just can't bear this any longer. I cannot. And C, the third evidence that kindness has its limits is Sodom and Gomorrah. God said, I will not tolerate this any farther. Now, these three examples are evidence to me, not, not including Isaiah here and the nation of Israel, that God says kindness, forgiving, forbearance, patience have limits. And when that, where that limit is, where that line is, is, that, is this. When God's patience and his mercy no longer have a redemptive effect, he then says, enough. And now punishment will start. Yes. I suppose parents do that a lot with their kids. You encourage them, you, you train them, you teach them, you chastise them, you admonish them, you do whatever. And finally, finally, you get to the point where the child, no matter how kind you are, no matter how educational you are, the child just needs a good spanking. Yes. Uh, not to educate them. No but to show them that mm -hmm. there is punishment mm -hmm. and accountability and responsibility mm -hmm. for the behavior. Mm -hmm. You see, because there's a parent-child, the child may not want a relationship, but the parent's going to have one. Yeah, one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was saying earlier. Mm -hmm. you, you may not know God. You may not have any, any thoughts in your mind of serving God, but God still has a relationship with you. He's keeping you alive. He made you. Yeah. And he holds you accountable, and he holds himself responsible, mm -hmm. and he will deal. And, and this is the point with Israel. Israel. Israel has come to the place where it is so recalcitrant, so hard-hearted. So arrogant. God says, I'm going to send the king of <clears throat> Assyria against a godless nation. I, I think that just nails, the, you know, is the nail in the coffin mm -hmm. that seals it off. So... Here comes the king of Assyria, the rod of God's anger. And, uh, and the king of Assyria, of course, is all pompous and arrogant, you know, just a strutting peacock, thinks he's, thinks he's God. You know, there, there, here's a sentence that I find to be so true. Man would be God. Every chance he gets. Look at, look, look at this verse here. By the strength of my hand, I have done this. And by my wisdom, because I have understanding, I removed the boundaries of nations. I plundered their treasures like a mighty one. I, subdu I subdued their kings. I reached into a nest and gathered abandoned eggs. So I gathered all the countries. Not one flapped a wing or opened its mouth to chirp. <laughs> this is the king of Assyria, mm -hmm. see, boasting yeah. in his great conquest. About how tough he how, is. How marvelous he is. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he, he's very fascinated by everything he has to say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> A legend in his own mind. That's right. Um, notice, though, verse 12. Back up to verse 12. When the Lord has finished all his works against Mount Zion and Jerusalem... He will say, I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look in his eyes. Two things out of that. Number one, God has a schedule for the work that's going to be done on Zion. It will be finished. It will accomplish what it's supposed to do. And then he'll deal with the king of Assyria after that work is done. And... He is justified in dealing with the king of Assyria because, actually, the king of Assyria is dealing with Israel for the very same problems. 
Isn't that interesting? Yeah. What goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. The king of Assyria has the same identical problems that Israel has. It's the problem of mankind. We all are, are cursed with it, especially when you get into politics and wield power. The great quest in this political year for power brings out and reveals how foolish are the ways of men. Politicians will be taking credit for every good thing under the sun. And blaming somebody else for all the bad things. Yes. And they all voted for them. <laughs> yes. You know, I think it would be really cool if I were running for president uh, in this coming millennium, and in this particular case, we have an outgoing president who, aside from some personal indiscretions, um, has managed to keep things moving along uh, with God's help. Um, or I should say, God has kept things moving along with Bill staying out of the way. <laughs> in, in spite, <laughs> in, in spite of our president. Uh, the, well, what I'm trying to say is that from the politician's <laughs> point of view, uh, I think I would say, look, we've had uh, a tremendous eight years under the reign of President Bill Clinton. Employment's been good. The stock market's been good. The economy's been good. Jobs are good. America's done well. Now, if I were a Republican, George Bush running, you know, George mm -hmm. W. running, I would, I would say, I intend to walk in his shoes. How much better can it be? <laughs> Rather than taking the other side of the coin and saying, look how bad it is. Mm -hmm. Because the fact is, at the end of every eight-year term, you, you know, it's always bad if you listen to the opposing mm -hmm. party. The uh, the problem is, though, it's really not the politicians who make the things happen. It's the embedded civil servants yeah. who make things happen. Right. You know, the, right. the politicians go and come. Right. They're in front of the camera. But the people who are there as civil servants for 30 and 40 years, you can enact any law you want to, but if the civil servants just sort of conveniently can't find the money mm -hmm. to make it work, mm -hmm. eh, maybe we'll do it, maybe we won't. Yeah. I have been there and seen it. Yes. I know. I, yes. I've actually had people tell me that. Yes, yes. The Lord looks down upon the kingdoms of men, and there have been very few kings who have been humble in their hearts. Well... You have to understand, it is a very alluring thing. You, you can go up there with the best intentions in your mind as to what you're going to do and how you're going to do it and how you're going to respond and how you're going to behave. But you live up there um, about six months, and with everybody treating you very nicely and taking care of all your needs and all of your wants and making sure that that all the nice things happen for you and to you, um, after a while, you get spellbound by that stuff. And uh, it's tough. What is it, the old saying, power corrupts? Mm -hmm. And absolute power? Corrupts absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yes. do it. In uh, verse 17 of Isaiah 10, the Lord declares that... Um, He's going to destroy, utterly destroy. And his destruction is sort of like a chain, um, a sequence of events. He's going to use Assyria to punish Israel. Then he's going to use Babylon to punish Assyria. Then he's going to use the Medes and the Persians to punish Babylon. And on and on and on. So we have God setting up kingdoms God taking down kingdoms. Um, jump over to verse 21. And the Lord makes a promise. You know, this is the neat thing about God's chastening or his discipline. He always brings promise. A remnant will return. A remnant of Jacob 
will return to the mighty God. Though your people, O Israel, be like the sand by the sea, only a remnant will return. Destruction has been decreed. Overwhelming and righteous. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, will carry out the destruction decreed upon the whole land. When the time comes for the destruction of the United States and the rest of the world, it will take place. It has been decreed, incidentally. And it will be overwhelming. It will be overwhelming and righteous. And righteous. I believe that um, the decree to bring destruction upon the earth, the entire earth, including the United States, became effective in heaven's court in 1994. We're living on borrowed time waiting for the... Ceiling of the 144,000. I believe that the seven angels that were given the seven trumpets in Revelation chapter 8, starting at verse 2, when the time came for the implementation of God's wrath, they were prepared to do their work of great harm. Immediately. Immediately. But. And as they go forth to conduct this harm, word comes, wait, hold back until the 144,000 are sealed. Now, when they are sealed, then the commencement of the Great Tribulation will commence. We are living on this at this very day in that time period where the judgment, overwhelming and righteous, has been decreed. But God tarries. We see a parallel with this in the ancient history of Israel. At the end of the 70 weeks, even though Israel had rejected the Messiah, and had refused to accept him. God did not immediately destroy Jerusalem in A.D. 33 or 34. Rather, he waited 35 years to give the Christian faith chance to mature and to get its act together and to extricate itself sufficiently from Judaism and to be spread into the then known world by the travels, you know, of the early Christians. Apostle Paul being the, the, the leader in mission work, you know. Um, when the Christian faith had reached a certain level of development, so that by tearing out the command and control center at Jerusalem, where the, most of the apostles continued to live, God would not destroy the very movement that he had put in place you know, to flourish throughout the earth. So God waited for 35 years to bring about the destruction of Jerusalem, and then he utterly destroyed it. In a similar way, the date for the destruction has come. We are living under the um, sword hung by a thread. <laughs> and uh, God could have, could complete could finish the sealing of the 144,000 uh, any day, any moment. It is only by divine mercy that we have this lingering, this pausing. And something for us to remember when it does occur, I guess it's one of those things that we need to accept I know there have been instances in Israel's past where they refused to accept God's judgment and they fought against it and they wound up hurting themselves more than if they had just backed up and said, okay, this is the Lord's will, this is, what we'll, this is the way we will live. The best one can do is to cooperate with God. Absolutely, no matter which way it goes. It, as a matter of fact, if you look further on in 24 and 25 verses, mm -hmm. the, the verses mm -hmm. here, do not be afraid of the Assyrians who beat you with a rod and lift up a club against you. Very soon my anger against you will end and my wrath will be directed to their destruction. That's right. And that's what's going to happen yes. in the future. At some yes. point in time, there's going to be an awful lot of death and destruction. Uh, 
in the world as we know it today. And, um, and th there's really no need for us to, to fear because God is in control. Mm -hmm. uh, those who are to die will die. Those mm -hmm. who are to be captive will be captive, mm -hmm. and the rest of it goes on. Mm -hmm. But it is decreed that this is going to happen. The sovereignty of God will be fully um, disclosed. I mean, and he has the power of life as well as the power of death. Mm -hmm. And I would rather trust him with that power than anybody else that I know of. Amen. In chapter 11, we come back to the hope and to the promise of restitution and restoration. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, and from his roots a branch will bear fruit. Verse 10, in that day the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the people, the nations will rally to him and his place of rest will be glorious. In that day the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria. God is about to bring destruction upon Israel, and yet he is still holding up the promise that through Israel will come Messiah. That's what the branch, the little shoot coming out of the stump of Jesse, the root of Jesse. Uh, verse 12, he will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Ephraim's jealousy will vanish and Judah's enemies will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, nor Judah hostile toward Ephraim. This is referring to the anger and hostility that existed between the ten tribes of the north and the two in the south. Then the Lord will dry up the gulf of the Egyptian sea. With a scorching wind, he will sweep his hand over the Euphrates River. He will break it up into seven streams so that men can cross over in sandals. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people that is left from Assyria, as there was for Israel when they came up from Egypt. What God is alluding to here is a time is coming when he is going to establish his own kingdom upon the earth. And all the people of God from all the nations will stream into the holy city. Um, he will gather from the four quarters of the earth, not the Jews biologically, but the Jews spiritually. This is where some confusion exists. Let me point this out, David, in the last few minutes we have on this side of the tape. See, in verse 10, we're talking about the root of Jesse will stand as a banner. Let me explain that. In ancient times, <clears throat> each nation had its own flag, like we do today the flag of Canada, and the flag of Mexico, and the flag of the United States are very distinct banners. We call them flags, but they're, in old time, ancient times, were called banners. Um, whenever the nations would form an alliance in order to go fight a larger enemy, or defend themselves with a larger enemy, since they didn't know each other, and many times didn't even speak the same language. They fought under banners. So it would be quite possible that if the Jews had made, let's say, an alliance with Egypt, that the, the Egyptians would fly their flag, the Jews would fly their flag, and for the purpose of the battle, there would be a unique flag that both would have, so they would know they were on the same team. 
understand how the banner works. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get lots of nations together, it's very quickly, it's very easy to become quickly confused. That's why when the Gideon and the Midianites, you know, they all woke up, heard the sounding of the trumpets and the fire, the uh, you know, that was the light suddenly broke out upon them. They they knew that everyone went crazy. He didn't, there were, they began to fight each other because they didn't know each other and you couldn't at night see the banner. <clears throat> so the importance of the banner cannot be understated. And each of the 12 tribes have their own banner. Well, God is talking about a time in the future when the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples, plural. The nations will rally to him. We're not talking just about Israel biologically. God is reaching farther forward and he's going to reach out his hand a second time you see that? A second time? To reclaim... Uh, verse 11. Right. To reclaim the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria. Now, this is where scholars get confused. Lay people don't have near as much trouble. <laughs> God is going to scatter Israel and punish them and take them into Babylonian captivity and he's going to restore them. That's the first gathering. A decree is going to be given by Artaxerxes in 457, you know, some 300 years from now, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem that will allow Israel to return. That's the first gathering. That's the first returning. That is not, though, under the banner of the root of Jesse. That will be under the banner of Zerubbabel. Okay? Right. Now, God here is talking in verse 10 and 11 about the second gathering. Because of the Babylonian captivity, the children of Israel are going to be scattered and many will choose to make their homes in the remote portions of the world and, not, and never to return to Jerusalem. Never. So the diaspora uh, is a dispersion that never again will Israel be locked up and cloistered within the confines of Jerusalem as they were. God is going to bring back a remnant from Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem. But ultimately, when, he sets, when Jesus comes at the end of the 70 weeks, plan A we're talking about, and he sets up his kingdom, then he's going to gather out of all the nations his children who've been scattered and under one banner they will come and God is going to make the way easy he's going to dry up the Red Sea he's going to dry up the Euphrates so that there will be no obstacle for those who want to be under his banner does that make sense to you? yeah it's, uh, and it's, it's very beautiful to see that uh, if anyone is willing to make the decision to go back home, it can be made very easy. Let me, re let me underscore this again in verse 15. The Lord will dry up the gulf of the Egyptian sea. That's is in the south. Mm -hmm. With a scorching wind, he will sweep his hand over the Euphrates River. That's in the north. We have God making it possible, easy. For all who want to be under his banner to come. In the time period of the Great Tribulation, God is going to make salvation enormously easy for people who are willing to come. We'll talk more about that. It's time to turn the tape over. We will pick up with uh, chapter 12 uh, when we resume. Let's take an intermission and then we will continue. Welcome back to the second half of tape number nine. This is in the series 209 titled Shadows of God. We're actually in the third tape on the book of Isaiah. 
And uh, we want to take a few moments and refresh the minds of our listeners with the concept of Plan A, Plan B. I'd like to first put it in perspective that Isaiah is living in around 730, 720 B.C. at the time we're having discussion here. Uh, Shalmaneser V destroyed the kingdoms of Ephraim, those ten tribes, in 722 B.C. King David ruled on the throne of Israel uh, about 275 years earlier, around 1000 B.C. So we're about 275 years from David in the process of time, the passage of time. Israel and Judah have uh, filled or Israel, the ten northern tribes, have filled their cups of sin or iniquity, so much so that God is destroying, going to destroy them by the, using the king of Assyria. And the apostasy of Judah is well under, you know, underway. Knowing that God is going to destroy them, uh, this destruction is symbolized as the chopping down of a great tree, the toppling of a great cedar. Cedars are particularly notorious for being enduring and drought and disease resistant. I mean, it's hard to kill a cedar tree, and they'll grow anywhere. And uh, to cut a tree off um, was like the same as toppling a nation. The, the symbolism was used. You might remember that um, Nebuchadnezzar was like a great tree, and the Lord chopped him off and put a band around the tree, indicating that um, one day the tree would be used again. So we're talking about the forthcoming captivity, although Isaiah has not expressly um, covered the Babylonian captivity in detail, but it's very clear that God is going to do something. And in um, verse chapter 11, uh, he talks about gathering the people under the banner of, you know, this, the root of uh, Jesse, speaking about the birth of Messiah. Now, let me just refresh a little bit about Plan A. In God's economy, there was no second coming ever in, uh, planned originally. God, uh, even though he knows the future, and even though he has complete and perfect foreknowledge, God does not operate on the basis of it. Yes, he knew that the generation that came out of Egypt would die in the wilderness. But he still gave them a chance to live. That's right. He gave them a chance to do what they would do. He gave them the opportunity to be all that he would have them be. See, this is, a, this is a hard thing, and you have to accept it by faith, that God will grant a child of his the privilege of failure as well as the opportunity for success. Even though he knows the outcome, God will nevertheless offer the privilege of failure or the opportunity for success. That's what free moral agent is all about. Being a free moral agent, you can choose rebellion or you can choose submission to the will of God. And like a child, how will you ever know the outcome of what a decision would be? Um, if you never let your kid drive because, well, I'm afraid he'll wreck the car. 
Yeah, it's like my dad saying when we were kids, I'm not, I'm not going to let you go swimming until you know how. Yeah, how does that work? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's kind of like, well, I would hire you, but you don't have any experience. Right. You know, I, right. I, I mean, I like you. Yeah, you're a nice kid, but hey. You know nothing. You know <laughs> How can I hire you? Well, how are you ever going to know anything? Right. How are you going to get three years of experience yeah. unless somebody somewhere hires you? Yeah. It's, it, it's the same way here. God has to give you the opportunity to make that decision so that when it's all said and done, you can look at it and say yourself, either, great, I made the right decision, or oops, I messed up. Because if God comes along and just says, well, I, I know in advance that you're going to mess this up. Well, that doesn't do anything for you because you're going to constantly think, well, I might not have messed it up. You know, God, God is not so interest, much interested in the, um, the outcome of life as he is so much interested in the process of life. Because he can take us wherever he wants us to end up, if we are willing. And at what point are we going to be willing to let him lead? You see, but some parents have very high goals for their children. And they impose these goals upon their children. With high expectations. With, with very high and demanding expectation. And they drive the child or children to meet those expectations. And they call this training. They call this um, parenting. They call this all kinds of words to cloak what is really little more than slavery. <laughs> <laughs> you will that, do this. That's right. right. <laughs> um, and then all of a sudden, Junior reaches adulthood. He is now expected to function as an adult. He is expected to make choices and, and behave as an adult. He's expected to um, meet with the successes of an adult. And Junior has never had yet to make one adolescent decision. <laughs> <laughs> How many kids, when I was working in a Christian college many years ago, how many kids I ran into who had had their lives mapped out by their parents hmm. only to go off to school and discover that there's a whole world out here that they didn't know anything about. <laughs> and mom knew nothing about it or dad knew nothing about this world. And they suddenly discover that they have no interest, really, in becoming all that dad or mom wanted them to be. They would like to have a life of their own. And uh, it was a most uh, agonizing experience. <laughs> <laughs> For parents as well. Oh, yes. It was, well, children. I've, had to, I've had to calm more than one set of parents. The point is, God knows and has objectives higher than the highest human thought can reach is his ideal for his children. If he could only get us there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if we had a clue. God is not going to impose it on us, though. You see, God says, look, if you don't choose it, you won't have it. But you can't choose something you don't understand or you don't know. So I'm going to teach you. I'm going to learn you. <laughs> as they used to say. Mm -hmm. um, so God, as the careful, loving parent, is working constantly to bring us into understanding. And, and this is true of Israel. He led that generation out of Egypt into the wilderness. And within 24 months, he intended to put them in the promised land. That's right. When he told Moses to send in the 12 spies there at Kadesh Barnea, God was ready to go forward. That's only 24 months from the time of the Exodus. Ten of the spies gave a poor report. Two 
Caleb and Joshua gave a faithful report. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, 10 and 2, because the nation of Israel eventually divided into 10 tribes and 2. That's, that struck me as an interesting parallel. And then the two finally became apostate and go into Babylonian captivity. And God is saying, okay, this is a dead end street. We've got to start over. So I'm going to bring Israel back home. First, I'm going to send them out of the land for 70 years. Then I'm going to bring them back home. Then I'm going to, I'm going to give them 490 years or 70 weeks to get their act together. Then I'll bring in Messiah. And uh, then with Messiah on board, we will bring in a, an end to the world and of sin and bring in everlasting righteousness and eternal life will now begin. And unfortunately, that one didn't work either. Plan A fell apart. Mm -hmm. Not because of God. No but because of the people. Right, right. But even, even during all this destruction and all this punishment, the 12th chapter of Isaiah says, you know, the, the remnant that's going to come back will be praising God because the, he has shown them a way out. Yes. And yes. That'll, that'll work at the end of time also. Verse 2, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. You know, um, God is giving a clue, a very beautiful uh, clue here, about this great highway that will make it easy to travel so that all of His children can come home. Before we went for the intermission, um, I was I wanted to make a point, and we ran out of time. Let me just sort of hit on it right at this time. When God sets out to save to the utmost, He makes salvation so easy so available, so within reach. So obvious. So obvious that all the sincere of heart, all of those who are accustomed to allowing the Spirit to have any influence in their lives can see it. In the great tribulation that we are about to experience, <clears throat> excuse me, God is going to make salvation so easy, so simple, so obvious, so clear that anyone who is accustomed to allowing the Holy Spirit to speak within their hearts will be saved, can be saved. The nature of man is to exclude others from the salvation that you have. The nature of religion is to say, here is the right way. All others are wrong. It is the nature of religion to become exclusive and separate so that others cannot, until they agree with you, enter in. God is going to crush that entire mindset in the coming Great Tribulation. And God is going to show the world that there are people um, in every religious system and in every place who will receive salvation on his terms if they are only informed as to what those terms are. The 144,000 are going to present a message that is so simple, so 
plain, so obvious. There's only one testing truth. There's not 27 or 50 points of faith. There's not even five essential doctrines. There's just one testing truth. And that is, will you worship God according to his command? And it's going to change an awful lot of paradigms the way people have thought about religion and the way people have thought about God and about what is right and what is wrong. And, and it's going to change. Uh, uh, it's something that's going to be forced for them to look at it because everything else has been torn down. I, Absolutely. I think of this, this earthquake over in Turkey, and I think of uh, the rich people and the poor people working all together on the same common level trying to rescue people who are trapped. Uh, something like that changes everybody's paradigm. It changes everybody's relationship. Uh, whether you're rich or whether you're free, your house is broke. Well, God has leveled the playing field. Exactly. No pun intended. Mm -hmm. But that's, that, that's exactly what's going to happen. Yes, yes. In chapter 13 of Isaiah, God now is going to give a prophecy concerning Babylon. And this is important because um, Babylon will be the rod of God's anger for taking care of the Assyrians. And, and incidentally, the Babylonians will also be the rod of God's anger that deals with the, the, the nation of two tribes of Benjamin and Judah. So, this is an oracle or a prophecy concerning Babylon that Isaiah saw. And uh, notice uh, how it starts. Raise a banner. That's a call to war. Fight under this banner. Raise a banner on a bare hilltop. Shout to them, beckon to them to enter the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my holy ones. I have summoned my warriors to carry out my wrath. Those who rejoice in my triumph. What's the significance of a bare hilltop? It can be seen uh, in any direction. Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. It's very obvious. Yes. Listen, a noise on the mountains, like that of a great multitude. Listen, an uproar among the kingdoms, like nations massing together. The Lord Almighty is mustering an army for war. They come from faraway lands, from the ends of the heavens, the Lord and the weapons of his wrath, to destroy the whole country. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp. Every man's heart will melt. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish will grip them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at each other, their faces aflame. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day, with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. God is using language here <clears throat> that we have covered in Joel chapter 2. Very similar language. Um, God in, uses the, the language in Joel 2 of the Lord thunders at the head of his army. And remember, they all, the soldiers all advance in a straight line without their ranks being broken. They, they grow through up walls, through windows. Every, nothing escapes them. Same, same picture given here. And we're looking at a description of a war 
that the Almighty would undertake. Now, under plan A, there would be a great war between Christ and his followers and Satan and his followers. Let me jump forward to plan B and then go back. At the second coming, in Revelation 19, John describes Jesus coming on a white horse and the armies of heaven are following right behind. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And John sees this angel standing in the sun, bright as the sun, and he calls the birds and the fowls to come and to fill their their stomachs on the flesh, you know, of, of the carrion or the carnage. And uh, so at the second coming, we read in Revelation 17 how that the kings of the earth make war against the rider on the horse. And, and so there's a, there's a real contest in plan B. At the second coming, the armies of earth will be aligned against the coming of Christ, and they will attempt, this sounds far out, I know, but it's the truth, they will attempt to destroy Christ with atomic missiles and whatever other weapons of war that can be mustered at the coming angels. Man is going to ultimately fight against his maker. Then at the end of the thousand years, when the holy city comes down, we have the wicked resurrected, and what do they want to do? They want to fight again. They want to take over the holy city and, and, and take it away from those to whom it has been given. And, and again, we have this war. Now, under plan A, there's this same war. It's this war of Christ and his followers against Gog and Magog and their followers. So under plan A, there would have been total annihilation of the wicked, just like there is under plan B. The difference in timing is 3,000 years. But would, it, would the first one have been using physical people to conduct the war? God, uh, Christ leading legions of, of humans? Or would it be angels, angels. coming again to do that? Look at this, 13 verse 3. I have commanded my holy ones. I have summoned my warriors to carry out my wrath, those who rejoice in my triumph. These holy ones, these are his angels. God was going to come with his angels. Now, understand something here. Let me make this point. At the second coming, it's not the angels who do the destruction. It's Christ. It's passes. Christ himself. Yeah. See, Christ, Christ is not going to ask his believers to go out and no. kill other human beings. No, no. He's not going to no. do that. No, that, he is king of kings. Mm -hmm. he, and he will take responsibility for this for, punishment and this destruction. For its implementation and execution, that's right. He will, he will do that. And the day of the Lord is a day, a cruel day, a day of wrath and fierce anger and bloodshed from one end of earth all the way to the other. And some of the description of that from 14 on is fairly, fairly awesome. Oh, yes. Um, you see, after Messiah had established his presence on earth, after Messiah had established Jerusalem as the center of his government, I'm talking about under plan A, had mm -hmm. Israel accepted him. Right. He then would have sent missionaries equivalent to the 144,000. All it, over the world. All over the world with the message, come to Jerusalem, come into the city and be saved, for I am about to destroy the earth. Jerusalem would have been another ark. That's correct. This is why he was going to dry up the rivers, a great highway, so that all could come. There would be no impediment, no natural boundary to keep you from getting there if you wanted to be there. God would have sent the 12 tribes under plan A into the world to gather his children to Jerusalem 
physically into the ark, the holy city. Then, as we will see when we get into Ezekiel and Jeremiah, he would then have brought the other nations under the banner of Gog against Jerusalem. And this is where then God brings fire down out of the sky and burns them up under plan A. And purifies the world. Purifies the, the world. That's at, right. So the problem was there was no Noah. What do you mean? Well, there was no one to, uh, uh, to accept Christ when he came uh, no. in order to build the boat, as it were. Well, no, Noah was there to hear the word of God and to believe it and to do it. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all these other people, they simply refused to build a boat. God had moved from the one man, one message the, um, scenario to the one family, one message scenario. He wanted to use the family of Abraham. Mm -hmm. He wanted a much larger... He, he, whereas in the days of Noah, the world was um, all... It was all bunched up. Yes, I'm trying to think of the right geographical description here. Everyone lived in a, in a geographical center. The, the, the nations were not diverse and scattered. The world had not been pulled apart. Tower of Babel and the confusion of languages did not exist. So one man, one message in Noah's day was appropriate. Because Go it could get the job done. Because it could get the job done. In the time of 34 A.D., there were nations, there were continents, there were people all around the world that needed and would, had to be reached. And so Christ would come, would establish his kingdom and begin that process until the day would come in which he would destroy the wicked and immortality would be placed upon all the redeemed. And he would have sent missionaries and empowered them to go to places like Australia and America and yes. Iceland oh, and, yes. Yes. and Russia and yes. China. And well, this is why he says here in Isaiah thirteen eleven, I will punish the world mm -hmm. for its evil, the wicked for their sins. It's not, this is not a local thing we're talking about. We're right. talking about plan A. I will put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. Um, verse 13, Therefore I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. And I've had people tell me that they just cannot conceive of a God of love being angry enough to kill anybody on the face of the planet or, or, or to punish anybody. They just can't. They just can't conceive of a God of love doing something like this. Well, all I can say is their conception is really ruined. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the reality of the Bible. That's does right. It? Uh, you can read it right out of the Bible. As a matter of fact, I, I, can... I, I did this one day. I've, I've read it to a lady right out of the Bible, and she just could not handle it. I, I can say that this is not surprising. In Noah's day, they could not conceive of a flood. Right. Or the message of destruction. Yeah. Yeah, they just couldn't, could not conceive it. But it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Not at all. Just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. This prophecy of Isaiah 12 is actually focused against the Babylonians. And before God addresses the Babylonians... He, he has stated what he's going to do, ultimately. Now we're going to turn our attention to the Babylonians. Verse 17. Behold, I will stir up against them, that is the Babylonians, the Medes, who do not care for silver and have no delight in gold. Which means they're after what? If they're not coming for plunder... Why are they coming? 
They just like to beat up on people. <laughs> <laughs> they just like to kill people. They like dominion. Like. Yeah. It's dominion. It's sure. all about power. They, they they like the power. Yes. And and the thing that really is is kind of mind boggling is verses fourteen through sixteen describes how people are going to be destroyed. What 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 just gets me is that reads like Kosovo. Yeah. Yeah. Children were killed. Yeah. Women were ravished. That, that, that means raped. Yes. Uh, anyone who was captured was killed. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just goes right. There's no mercy. There is absolutely no mercy on either side. So the Babylonians, for all their arrogance and all of their haughty ways and for all of their grandeur and pomp, they will be brought down by the Medes. And uh, verse 19 Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the glory of the Babylonians' pride, will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. Funny how the economists don't figure into this at all, do they? No. Verse 20, she will never be inhabited or lived in through all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherd will rest his flocks there. But desert creatures will lie there. Jackals will fill her houses, and there the owls will dwell. And there the wild goats will leap about. Hyenas will howl in her strongholds. Jackals in her luxurious palaces. Her time is at hand, and her days will not be prolonged. Babylon. That marvelous city, one of the ancient wonders of the world. The great pride of Nebuchadnezzar and those who followed in his shoes. Babylon, the crown jewel of the kingdoms of the earth, becomes the haunt of jackals and owls. You see, no matter how mighty the United States may think it is, no matter how great and powerful it may say of itself. God only needs to speak the word, and it becomes a desert. Mm -hmm. A desert. Her time will come. It's interesting. Her time is at hand. That's also uh, the same kind of a phrase they would use for childbirth. Yeah. Her time is at hand. Yeah. Her days will not be stretched out right. or elongated or prolonged. Right. right. Um, it's going to happen. In chapter 14, we only have a few minutes, and I'd like to, to make two or three interesting points. We're moving a little slower than I had hoped, but um, <laughs> that just goes with having a good time I when, guess you're, so. when you're discussing and studying God's Word. In chapter 14... God is going to give us an insight as to what really motivates Babylon. God sometimes has to speak in parables to make understanding possible. In chapter 14, verse 1, God starts off through Isaiah saying, The Lord will have compassion on Jacob. Once again, he will choose Israel and will settle them in their own land. Okay, he's talking about restoration. Yes, you're going to leave the land. Yes, you're going to return to the land. You have my word on it. As a matter of fact, other people are going to join you. Aliens will join them and unite with the house of Jacob. That's what I was talking about under plan A. At the end, God is going to send his servants out into the world, and the aliens are going to come and join and be part of Israel. All nations will be the Israel of God. God intended to use Israel, uh, the literal nation of Israel, as, as his mouthpiece, because salvation is open to all who will come. He's going to dry up the rivers so that they can come. A great highway so they can get there easily and quickly. So God intends to restore Israel from their captivity 
and eventually, at the right time, aliens will join with them and unite with the house of Jacob. Nations will take them and bring them to their own place, and the house of Israel will possess the nations. Okay, now verse 3. On the day the Lord gives you relief from suffering and turmoil and cruel bondage, you will take up this taunt against the real king of Babylon. Now the word real I am inserting. You will take up this taunt against the real king of Babylon. Um, I want to jump down to verse 12. How have you fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Those who stare at you, they ponder you, your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble, the man who made the world a desert, who overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home? Okay, what are we talking about here? We're talking about the expulsion of Lucifer from heaven. This, uh, this particular piece here sounds to me like um, the people who are inside the holy city looking out. Or it could also be... Uh, it is. That's precisely what it is. Yeah. It, it, it could also be uh, the people who meet Jesus in the air and look back on the earth as they ascend well, and look at all, all right. of this. Now, now, now you're talking plan B, but plan B is not <clears throat> in the Old Testament. Right. <laughs> Right, I, I understand that. I understand that, but but it's still true for but, Plan B. Yeah, but uh, but but the people inside the holy city, looking out, whether it's Plan A or Plan B, mm -hmm. so still the same. Would would look out at a destroyed Earth. Yes, everybody's dead. Yes, and they'll look out here and they will stare at you and ponder your fate. Is this the man mm -hmm. who shook the earth mm -hmm. and would not let his captives go home? Mm -hmm. That 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 was a particularly mean king who yes. wouldn't let captives go back home. You know, after he had secured everything, he's he's Even exacting tribute and all of this, and he still won't let them go home. When Artaxerxes, and when. Uh, Darius um, had finally gained control of their kingdoms. They issued decrees. Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes issued decrees allowing their people to go back home. Sure, if the people go back home and, and make money and make mm -hmm. crafts and, and furniture and stuff like that, then he can exact taxes. Well, sure, sure. You know, this is not dumb. But, but, th but, you know. but this is meanness. Yes, uh, it, it's just overt cruelty. Yes. This is a... A passage that would have been fulfilled under Plan A. See, you've got to remember, the Old Testament doesn't know about Plan B. It's only because we live after and under Plan B that we can understand. So putting the shoes or the sandals on of mm -hmm. Isaiah to put this into perspective, God is going to bring punishment upon Babylon. We just saw that mm -hmm. in chapter 13. Right. God is going to have compassion on Jacob, and he's going to return his people to their homes, their own land, 14.1. See that? In 14.3, when you get back home, and the time will come and the day will come, when you will take up this, this taunt against the real king of Babylon. And I say, I say the real king because the earthly king is a chip off of the, the old block. He's just doing what? comes natural. The real king of Babylon, both in plan A and plan B, is the devil. It's Satan. Uh, you might remember in Revelation 13, when people worship the dragon, I mean the beast, they are also worshiping the dragon who gives its power to the beast. Satan is called the prince of this world by Christ for a very important reason. 
He has that authority and power. He is the ruler of the kingdom of darkness. He, which, u he usurped it from Adam and Eve. Yes, yes. So here is the taunt the redeemed will, will offer. Now that's kind of interesting. Yeah. It'd be a taunt. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're taught all your life not to do that. Make you know? fun, yeah. ridicule. <laughs> How the oppressor has come to an end. He, in other words, God believes in equal injustice. He believes in judicial equilibrium. You get what you paid for. Mm -hmm. And uh, how the oppressor has come to an end, how his fury has ended. The Lord has broken the rod of the authority of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, which in anger struck down peoples with unceasing blows and in fury subdued nations with relentless aggression. All the lands are at rest and at peace. They break into singing. Even the pine trees and the cedars of Lebanon exult over you and say, Now that you, O king of Babylon, have been laid low, no woodsman comes to cut us down. The grave below is all astir to meet you at your coming. It rouses the spirits of the departed to greet you. And all those who were leaders in the world, it makes them rise from their thrones. All those who were kings over the nations, they will all respond. They will say to you, you also have become as weak as we are. You have become like us. All your pomp has been brought down to the grave. Along with the noise of your harps, maggots are spread out beneath you and worms cover you. How have you fallen from heaven? And so on. Well, we're out of time. We've got six seconds to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pick up next time in Isaiah chapter 14 because this is most important. May God bless. It's been a lot of fun to be with you, Dave. Good to be here. With you, Dave. Good to be here. With you, Dave. Good to be here. With you, Dave. Good to be here.